Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. How's it going? I am well, thank you. OK, so Stuart and I are going to talk for a while, and then we're going to do questions from Twitter. Um, the hashtag is Ask Stuart. So people on Twitter, Ask Stuart. Um, I met you a couple years ago, and I, so I didn't know you from Flickr or Yahoo. Um, I met you right when Slack was starting, and I was at this dinner with a bunch of other entrepreneurs. And I remember asking you what Slack was, and you told me, well, you know, it's group chat for work based on IRC. And I remember thinking, this is why you're the entrepreneur and I'm the journalist. I remember thinking, this is the dumbest idea. <laughs> Uh, because, because you know, it had existed before and other things. It didn't seem like totally novel, um, and I, I, it was like I kind of felt bad for you. Um, <laughs> so I don't feel bad for you anymore. It's like one of the. It's growing pretty quickly. It's it's, you know, successful. A lot of people here probably use it. We use it at the New York Times. Um, but I I still like wonder why. Why Slack took off in a way that a bunch of other, uh, you know, group chat products didn't take off. Um, what do you think it was? Historical accident. So I mean, I could, I love the product and I work on it all the time. And so I could go up with like a really long list of features that I think are better and that make some kind of difference. And it's possible that the sum of all those makes a qualitative difference that is like just enough to pu push people over the threshold of, I don't want to use this, I want to use it. Um, but I also am a big believer in increasing returns. So once it gets some traction, um, people will uh, experience the social proof of their peers using it, or they'll see that this they're reading an article and the media company that published the article uses it. And enough of that kind of adds up that they'll start using it themselves. Well, I just, by the way, um, someone recently said that they wanted to emulate my just particular style when I'm speaking, and I just have the periphery of my eye, I can see the camera on me there, and so I can see like just the motion of my hands. Very, very distracting. Do you have a particularly, do you have like a signature gesticular style? I didn't think so. I didn't even know that I had it at all, but I noticed that anytime there's photos of me from a context like this, my hands are in the air. So. Oh, okay. So, uh, <laughs> I also think that timing makes a really big difference. Like if we had launched three years before we did, it wouldn't have taken off the way that it did. I think there was something about that moment, and there's like a, this is too long or too boring to get into, I think. But there's a whole bunch of factors that make that up, and one of them is that messaging for most people in this room probably is uh, a, an old or even kind of ancient technology. But for most people on the surface of the planet, it's something that only came post-smartphone. And then again, smartphones seem like they've been around forever, but most people didn't. You know, like the iPhone was announced in 2007, I think, and available in 2008. Most people didn't get one then. They didn't get one in 2009. Some people got them in 2010. Some people got them in 2011. So it's a, it's a really new thing. So the idea of messaging specifically for work wouldn't have made as much sense in 2010, 2011. Okay, so you, you had the timing down, and you had a few features that, uh, that other companies didn't have. But, I mean, you, you're the... As from what I know, you're among the fastest or perhaps the fastest growing business application of all time. So far, you're adding, you told me, 10,000 paid customers, paid seats a week now. Um, did that phenomenal level of growth surprise you? And what do you, and, and what do you attribute that to? Um, it definitely surprised me. So when, at the time that I first met you, it would have been like the here's where we are today, and like the whole ambition for what we were doing was probably calibrated to here. Um, and, and we're continuing to grow. So, you know, again, I think it's a lot of his increasing returns. So this is a double-edged sword, and we're kind of in the same position that Twitter was in 2010, 2011, where 100% of the media uses us. So, you know, someday <laughs> things will go wrong, and, and we'll feel the other side of that. Right. So it seems like anything Slack does is significant. Um, did you try to do that? Did you, did you go after media companies? I no. Mean, it seems I mean, like a pretty smart strategy. It, it would have been a very smart strategy. <laughs> no, but we didn't think of that, and it just happened. I mean, I remember the first, uh, I don't remember when that dinner was, but you know, probably a couple months before that, we were like begging um, some of our friends to please try it, and we realized how hard it was, because uh, you're changing the way that you communicate with people at work. 
And that's a really big change because people spend, you know, if you're a knowledge worker, maybe the floor is something like 30% of your time is spent on communication. But most people, it's probably more like 50%. And I mean, like, reading, writing emails, reading, writing technical specifications or marketing documents or composing um, PowerPoint decks or going to meetings or status reports or any, you know, all of those things are, are about communication. And if you're a manager, it's like 80%. If you're an executive, it's probably like 99% of your time. And so we're asking people to change how they were doing everything. And that was a really, it was a big ask. And in comparison, I'm a happy Dropbox customer. I have two computers. I wanted the same files to be on both. I'm also pretty lazy, so I didn't want to back up. And nine bucks a month seemed like an amazing bargain to not have to do that work. But you can't unilaterally decide that you're going to use Slack to communicate with your colleagues at work. Everyone has to buy into it. And at the moment you're, um, you're starting off, there's no value. Like, you know, if you're the very first person in there, you can't send a message to anyone because there's no one else to send a message to. No files have been uploaded. There's no, nothing to search, you know, nothing to comment on. Uh, so it's, it's a really big hump. Uh, and I guess we focused a lot on trying to get people over that hump, which is both giving them enough of, a, of an idea of what they were getting that they would kind of pull through any friction and also to try to remove all the friction. I think one of the... Um, so you, I don't know if this has changed over time, but sort of in the early, early days, you pitched it sort of in two ways. One is that it was more efficient and faster and, and better than email, like as a replacement for email. And another, I think this fits into your sort of bigger philosophy about the product, is that it would add transparency to the organization and new people joining would get sort of this history of what happened, that it would actually change kind of the culture of work. Um, so... Is it more the second now? Is it more that versus we're just better than email? Well, uh, yeah. I mean, so we never used the email killer in our, in our public statements or marketing or anything like that, so people picked it up. They do go together, though, because one of the side effects of using email as the primary means of communication inside an organization is that no matter who you are inside that organization, like you could be the CEO, you could be the most junior employee, you only have access to a really narrow slice of what's going on. Because most of the conversations are, you know, this person, this person, and these two BCC'd or something. And none of that is ever accessible to you. Whereas in Slack, the default mode of communication is public. And so it's much more likely that those conversations will happen out in the open. And it's transparent, like, the word transparency in the context of business often means just like the bosses are forthcoming about what's really going on. Or sometimes that there's um, upwards transparency so that people can see. Um, what's going on, the bosses can see what's going on around the business, but this is much more lateral. So the marketing team can see where the sales team needs better support or the uh, engineers can see what the designers are working on, things like that, which is something that people put a lot of effort into causing to happen. That's what all those like daily stand-up meetings and status reports are about. And the other one is that your first day on the job at a place where email is the primary means of communication, you have an empty inbox, despite the fact that there might have been millions or tens of millions of messages that exchanged before you got there. And Slack gives you access to those. So they really, like both the transparency thing and the b building something of value out of the communication archives are both in contrast to the way people use email. But it seems like if, you're, um, if part of the pitch for Slack is that in it increases transparency in the organization, and if you're selling like your, the, actual, the people who are actually paying are sort of the bosses, they may not want transparency in the organization. Some bosses may not want. I mean, there's definitely some unhealthy uh, workplace dynamics that won't do well with Slack. So one of them is um, to the extent that managers feel like they have to withhold the availability of information as a means of exercising power. Like so some people are in the loop and some people aren't. That becomes much harder to, to maintain because Communication doesn't have to go like escalate it up to a manager, across to another manager, and then back down again. It can just happen like this. Um, so I think that would be threatening to certain unhealthy styles of management. But I don't, I don't think that's a majority of workplaces. I mean, people are uh, imperfect, and it's very, it's surprisingly difficult for human beings to deal with one another. So there's all, usually all kinds of screwed up things in every workplace, but they're not usually because people are maliciously you know, pulling the strings. It's just because it's hard for people to relate to other people. But do people want, I mean, do people, do people in the like, one part of a company generally want people in the other part of the company to be able to see what they're doing? Because I'll tell you what happens at, at the times. Like, when we first started using it, we, I mean, and we still have a whole bunch of public channels and we can like, look at what people are doing, but the 
private channel communication is thriving. Uh, and so people say a lot of stuff in there that they don't want their bosses to see or don't want other people to see, don't want their colleagues to see. Um, I assume that happens everywhere. And then that sort of goes against your Yeah, well, idea. it's still the default mode of communication. And it's still much like orders of magnitude more communication ends up public than it would have been in an email context. Because effectively, none of it is public in an email context. And you're right. Certainly, the bigger the team gets, the more communication goes private. And part of that is just a volume issue. Like, it's, it's exponential. The, the amount of communication that's going to happen grows exponentially with the number of people. Um, and so you, know, you can just, if everything is public, you could waste a lot of time just reading everything that's going on across the organization, even if it doesn't have anything to do with you. And then there's some of it, like you know, what you said was, don't want my bosses to see this. There's some of that. And there's also some of, like, this is just not ready yet. Like, I don't need anyone else's input. We're just working out the basics of this problem. So my initial proposal, like, you, you might bang an idea off of someone that you don't want all of the editors to see right then, because you right. don't really need them poking in. And I never want the editors to see. Yeah, OK. So there you go. So, like, so some of those conversations you want to have in, for lack of a better term, a safe space. Like, you want a controlled group of people who are, who are exposed to it. Because right. if you have you know, 1,500 other people poking in, then it's not so great. Isn't it isn't a safer space to have a face-to-face -face communication? Um, and this really leads to sort of a couple of things that have been in the news recently. There's this uh, Gawker trial with um, Terry Balea, also known as Hulk Hogan. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, Breitbart last week. People posted a bunch, of, or this week, people posted a bunch of screenshots from Slack. If those people had been having conversations like just in the office, uh, I assume you know people could have like recorded them or taken notes or something. But this is like very obvious uh, proof of what people said, and it comes up in legal settings. Like, aren't you creating this trail of conversations that can be used against you at some point? Uh, well, it's not like you know up until 2013, everyone just did everything face to face, and then suddenly right. Slack came along, and we're like, oh shit, now we should use these computers. So we have. Um, <laughs> Because, like, remember the Tinder lawsuit as screenshots of the texts, and I remember, like, I got and every lawsuit has emails. Yeah, like two thousand two, two thousand three, whenever that was. I remember I read enough Enron emails until I just got completely bored of all of them, or the Sony hack um, a year and a half ago. So, but still, the the like threshold for sending an email is higher than the threshold for saying something in Slack. Like, I may say a pretty dumb thing in Slack. I mean, I do. I've said some dumb things. Uh, Right, whereas like an email is a little bit more considered, I think. It will take some time for people to get used to any new form of communication. But I, I, I mean, if you look at the Sony emails, people say a lot of dumb stuff in email. <laughs> and it, in fact, so I was talking to a hedge fund manager uh, two weeks ago, and they, their company just switched to Slack. I was telling you this last night, but the. Um, the deciding factor for them was they were doing a lot of business communications via text message. And the lawyer said, hey, next time we get sued and there's a discovery, you get deposed, do you want to turn over all of your text messages to, to opposing counsel and have them sort through and decide which ones are relevant to the case? Even your private Yeah, all of, like every, every single text message that you send. Or would you prefer to move your workplace messaging into Slack and keep um, iMessage, SMS for private stuff? And that was a, no, that was a very simple question for them. Um, so that partitioning of information, I think, will be really important. Is this a concern that companies have? Like, when, when they're um, deciding whether to move to Slack, I mean, I guess they're generally deciding they probably already are using email a lot. But um, is, it something, is it a concern that they're just going to have a lot more in this record that can be used in discovery in other places? I haven't heard that as a concern. But I'm not even sure that it would be true. Because so it's also people aren't just using email, right? So people will. SMS with coworkers, people will use Skype chat, people will use Hangouts. We see all kinds of you know, unexpected, let's say, forms of communication. People will use private Facebook groups. Um, people will use like document commenting extensively or task management systems, but the comments in the task management system become something like a Slack channel. So there's, like, there's definitely a lot of latent desire, and it was expressed in different ways, and Slack is kind of consolidating those. I think there should be some, like, social, this huge social pressure against screenshotting slacks. Like, I think there should be, it, that should be a very, very bad thing to do. Uh, someone, I don't know who was it, Glenn Fleischman, um, 
also a journalist, suggested special, like, indetectable to the human eye little patterns uh, called stenographs inside of Slack. Oh, so you'd so know. You'd see who, who screenshotted it. Yeah. Are you doing that? No. <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting idea, though. That's a great idea. <laughs> It's like when people often, when you send out um, presentations or documents, you know, to different parties, you'll change one number here and there. And Hollywood does that for like, like they watermark DVDs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you should do that. Um, what else is uh, so? What are you doing in Slack? Like, what's what can we expect? What are the big sort of additions that are coming? So a lot of that. Well, I'll do it really fast because a lot of it will be boring. I think. Um, okay, don't do the boring stuff. Okay. I'll, I'll go quickly over the boring stuff. Um, right now, the biggest individual Slack teams are um, in the thousands of users, and I think that's probably where it, it breaks down. So we have customers that are, have five, 8,000 um, people using Slack, but they're on different teams, and it becomes a problem for them uh, because it, well, it used to be uh, that two people work at the same company, they both use Slack, but they're not in any teams in common, and now they can't send each other messages, even though that's the way they used to communicate. So they'll have to step out and use Skype chat or something like that. Now they have the opposite problem, which they're on three or four teams in common with someone else. So if, you know, we're, we're both at the times and we're both on multiple teams together, and you sent me a link to something, and now I want to go back and find it, we might have three or four different versions of the Farhad Stewart conversation. And, it's, it's difficult to find it. So consolidating um, the team directory, federating multiple teams together into one organization, that's the enterprise stuff. Um, we're doing a lot of stuff on platform that for me is very exciting. We're seeing a lot of more developers. We launched an $80 million fund to invest in companies that we're building on Slack. So platform is other people developing apps that run or that have some kind of interface in Slack. Yeah. Basically like a command line or something like that. Yeah, so it can be, it can be 100% in Slack, although I think it's probably much more likely um, that it'll be you know, 20% or 30% in Slack and 70% elsewhere. So people do things like in, in Salesforce to assign a new account to an account manager, you can do a command in Slack. But if you're going to go do a bunch of forecasting for Q4 sales, then you actually go to Salesforce because there's no point rebuilding all of the Salesforce inter interface inside of Slack. This for other occasional use things, like filing an expense report, you might as well just do the whole thing in Slack. You can send a picture of the um, receipt, you can answer a couple questions, and then you're done filing your expense. This fits into this larger trend of messaging companies trying to become platforms and sort of messaging becoming kind of like the interface for a bunch of different use cases. Um, why is that happening? Why, why is it better to run my expense program in Slack versus just go over to a new web window? There's, uh, well, so there's, I mean, two different things. So one, in the general sense of messaging um, applications becoming platforms, there are a couple dozen think pieces on Medium that probably have better explanations of it than okay. me. Okay, we'll post for the, links. For the expense report example, though, I think those things that are really, like, so we, we use it for filing bugs inside of Slack. And I can type slash bug and then at somebody's name and then type something out. And I hit enter. And so the alternative to that would have been, and this, is a long list, but it's not really that cumbersome. But it's get out of Slack and go to the browser, hit Command T to open a new tab, start typing the URL of the bug tracker, wait till I've typed enough that it auto completes, hit enter, wait for that page to load, hit the new bug button, wait for that page to load, and then start typing it. And just removing those like seven steps of friction make it much more likely that it's going to happen in real time. Now, there still is a bug tracker UI, and people can still go there and do it. But it's not just that I did the command from Slack. It's that whoever I assign the bug to will get a notification in Slack and a copy of it will be posted into the bugs channel. And then when they change the status, I'll get a notification. And when it's eventually resolved, that'll also be posted in the bugs channel. And now there's like this big system of records. So it's not just about the, the workflow of creating the bug, it's about having like a window into that workflow that exists in Slack. And that's really important because people spend a long time. Average across all of our daily active users, so including people who are just getting started, is a little over two hours a day in active usage, 10 hours a day connected to Slack. So people, Slack becomes the one thing that you have open alongside whatever your role-specific function demands. And this might be Photoshop, this might be Salesforce, this might be Excel, this might be Word, whatever. Whatever it is that you're supposed to be doing at your job, the other thing you have open is Slack. Um, say that again. How, how much time do, are people spending in Slack? Two hours and 20 minutes a day, and what we call active usage means, so like uh, reading a message, writing a message, uploading a file, commenting a file, opening the app, changing channels, like any, any kind of activity that we can detect. Do you think that that's good? 
Do you th I, well, I, I do think, so people um, often compare that to, say, Facebook. I think it's 45 minutes a day or something like that, and say, wow, that's great. We think it's, it's good that people are, are utilizing it a lot. We definitely don't feel like increasing that number is a goal, and in fact, decreasing that number might create a better experience. I mean, we wouldn't want to get to zero, right? Because then there's obviously no utility in Slack, but it might be that an hour and 52 minutes is better than two hours and eight minutes or something like that. Right, so how do you think about, how do you think about whether Slack is making people, uh, helping people to become more productive versus uh, helping them waste their time? How do we measure it, or how do we, how do you, how do we think about it? Do you measure it? it? How do you think about it? Do you worry about it? Uh, I can't remember what the saying is, but there's some saying like, when someone gets rich, they just get more of whatever they were in the first place. You know that one? No. Oh, OK. <laughs> someone, someone knows it. Someone will tweet it. Okay. Um, but it's a little bit more like, uh, if Slack enhances all kinds of communication. And so there's all kinds of communication that happens in the workplace. Um, I think it's going to be on net a huge improvement. There's a McKinsey study from I think 2012 that just looked at how people spend their days in the context of knowledge work and how much of it was spent reading and writing email, how much of it was spent, and this is the one that was, I think, really shocking, um, looking for information to 20%. And, it, and almost always, like, certainly in my own experience, it's like dumb factual information. It's not like something, like some deep question that I need to spend a lot of time thinking about. It's like, what was our total number of daily active users on March 12th or something like that? Or how long did it take us to double this number last time? Or when is someone back from vacation? Or who is so-and-so's manager? You know, like just basic factual information. Um, and that becomes a lot easier to, to manage and manipulate and search for inside of Slack. So that'll be a, a big reduction. Um, people fool around in the office and have friendly conversations, that will probably also be enhanced. But I think that the, the fact that the, the productive work is enhanced as much um, means that on net, it's a, it's a better one. And actually, now I remember, I didn't say the interesting thing that I'm looking forward to, just the boring ones like Android oh, yeah. Platform. The one that I'm really looking forward to is um, a lot of the kind of nascent activity we're seeing around bots now are things like ordering office supplies or booking travel. Um, but there's things like PM bot, like a product manager bot that at a specified time of day will ask everyone, hey, what are you working on? And are you blocked in anything? And then it'll collate the results and distribute them out to everyone on the list, which is like what the, the project manager or the product manager might have done earlier. And it saves that person 10 minutes. But the cool thing is that the bot will remember that forever whereas someone else would have remembered it just for a moment. Um, and then you can start to ask it how long this project took, or who, when they do those daily check-ins, um, says that they're working on Android a lot for, for what we want to know who the best people on Android are six months from now. So the bot becomes kind of like a manager. It does. Um, uh, like a very helpful manager, ideally. Like someone who is facilitating. For now. For, yeah. <laughs> very good. Um, when it has enough of that information, we also have another one that's called Glossary Bot or Glossbot. And then, because there's a lot of internal jargon and acronyms inside of every organization, and rather than have hundreds of people ask hundreds of other humans what this means, you can just ask the bot. And you keep on training it, and it starts to learn um, the relationship between different concepts and, and bits of terminology. But you put all the activity of those things together and use it as a legend or a key to decrypt the whole corpus of information. Then all of those, you know, the 20% of people's time that is spent on just looking at factual information becomes much easier. You ever see the movie Her? I haven't, but I've heard about it. All right, well, have, have any of you seen the movie Her? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, so you remember. It comes when, up often in these kinds of conversations. Yeah, it is. It's really, and so I should probably watch it. This is, it, it's a great movie, first of all, um, but also illustrates, I think, uh, the dividing line between what people imagine is like a general purpose artificial intelligence and what we have today. Yeah. Um, but just on the, on the dumb side of the AI, there's this moment where she reveals her, the, the OS that he's in love with, reveals to him that she's simultaneously talking to like 600 other people and he's kind of heartbroken. But that's the thing about bots is they're very patient. They don't care if you ask it the same question over and over again. They can deal with hundreds of people at once. So I think that could be, uh, a productivity enhancer or kind of like an augmentation of human intellect that's like on the order of value that Office has been over the last several decades, so like hundreds of billions of dollars and decades worth of productivity gain. Are you making these bots? 
Um, we are trying to make some of them, but we're more trying to facilitate them because I think our odds of making that thing that I'm just describing pretty low because you know there's two huge AI research labs at Google and then like the machine learning AI workers that are spread throughout the whole company, but also Baidu and Microsoft and Facebook and you know all these companies that have been investing in this area for a long time. So we have like a, a tiny chance of doing it. However, um, in that analogy of it being Office. Um, Slack is the Windows that it would run on, you know, like, because Slack or something Slack-like is the only environment where an application like that would make sense. It wouldn't make sense in email. It wouldn't make sense on a wiki. It wouldn't make sense in a task management program or anything like that. So, um, do you, where do you think we are right now in terms of, like, we don't have these bots. Where do you think we are right now in terms of whether Slack? but messaging, specifically social software at work, is making us more productive? Um, well, so we do have some of them now, right? And those aren't like huge productivity gains at this point, the, like the scheduling bots and the, um, the, the travel booking and stuff like that. It's a marginal increase, which is good, because you, you add up enough of those. Um, and it makes a difference, and Slack's attitude towards every other application that people use is, for whatever other application it is, we would like to make your experience of that better. But um, we have, we sent out a survey to a whole bunch of team owners and administrators who got back 1,600 responses, so like a, a very sizable number of responses, um, you know, like close to the same number of people infer polling results for the whole country, and the average, or the weighted average response to the question, how much more productive has Slack made your team? 32%. So for sure, we didn't really make them 32% more productive because that would be like a decade and a half or a couple decades worth of accumulated productivity gains. But the experience is like that. And I think that if you asked, I can't see the audience really because of the lights, um, but I bet if we said, hey, how many of you put up, you use Slack, then most people here, like 50 plus percent would say yes. Um, how much would someone have to pay you to take it away? Um, and I think that that answer would be a lot, and that would be indicative of how people... It would be more than you charge. It would be much, much more than we charge. I mean, certainly, we're very dependent on our own products, so we would pay, I don't know, like 500 times what we would charge ourselves to, to use the product. Um, but I think that would be true for, for most people. Just to, to go back to, to email, because if you ask most of our customers what they use before Slack, 80% will say nothing. So they don't think about this as a, as a category. It's not something that they, you know, they don't think about what they do. There have been um, some economic studies over the, past, that, that over the past few years, but one recently that suggested that software generally, like tech, is not making us more productive. Like we're not seeing it in kind of gross economic statistics. What do you think about that? I think that I should have read that article that was in the Times a couple of weeks ago before I came here. You should read the Times every day. <laughs> it will make uh, you more productive. But this is something. <laughs> <laughs> this is something that I've personally been interested in for a long time. So, in either 90, 1998 or 1999, uh, a University of Colorado professor named Tom Landauer wrote a book called *The Trouble with Computers*. And he was cross-posted in economics and human-computer interaction. And the, the thesis of the book was there's a lot of usability problems that prevent our use of computers from having the productivity impact that they could have. But when, they, when we say could have, it's like computers at first were, you know, they're very good at arithmetic and they also have infinite memory, so they replace things like double entry accounting. And in the 1960s, you could see the direct impact in productivity gains from investment in IT. And same thing true in the early 70s, and then the late 70s, 1980s, 1990s, there was just no improvement from productivity gains. So he would use examples like this, and I'm going to use the male pronoun deliberately. In 1958, the CEO, when he wanted to send a letter, would come out to the secretarial pool, all of whom were like trained professional typists, and he would dictate a letter, and they would type it up super fast, and he would look at it and say, mm -hmm, and then go like this, and then it was done. So like two minutes and 40 seconds to, to write a letter. Then you go. 40 years into the future, 1998, and that same CEO would be sitting at his desk, and he's got Word open, and he's fucking around with the tab stops, and he can't get the, the, why is this part indented, and he's editing the same sentence over and over again, and now that same letter took 45 minutes. So um, all of that increase in computing power, all of these new like um, point-and-click Windows-based UIs, all of these usability studies, all this huge investment has led to 
you know, a 10 or 20 times increase in the time it takes to do this menial task. That's obviously cherry picking like the, the most egregious example. Um, but you know, it was a pretty convincing book at the time. And then right after he published it, like what, I can't remember if it was 98, 99, uh, economists started seeing big increases in productivity from investment in IT. And so this is now what has been later suggested to, to be debunked. So like the thesis then was, oh, I guess it was the internet. Like we were waiting for the internet this whole time. Now that we finally have the internet, there's this huge payoff from all the personal computers we bought and all the networking gear and all the stuff we've been spending money on, the switches and the routers and stuff like that. Um, so partly, there, I don't, there's another joke that I don't remember, but like you ask, if you want 13 opinions about economics and ask a dozen economists, um, and it's a little bit like, you shouldn't eat animal fat, but no, actually, animal fat's okay. You shouldn't eat carbohydrates. Sugar is poison. Maybe carbs are okay, whatever. Like, it just goes back and forth. Um, but it could also just be that productivity, which is just gross output divided by cost, yeah. um, is not something that's going to accurately measure our experience of it. Because there's just there's so many things that we used to do that we don't do anymore, and so many new things that we do now, which we didn't do 20 years ago. So those kinds of comparisons are, are, are pretty difficult. So I don't know whether to trust the study or to trust people's direct experience of it. And people in their direct experience, certainly I feel like, oops, I feel like I am more productive now than I would have been in 1995. Right, we're able to do, I mean, your company is uh, based in several places. You have, you live half the time in Vancouver and, yep. you, and your headquarters are in San Francisco, you have people in New York. Like we're able to do all of this stuff because of tools like Slack mm -hmm. that, I guess it's not in the productivity numbers. It might be in some way, but it but it's sort of a qualitative change in how we work. Uh, I did get this Sunday's Times, and I was here in Austin. It was a little bit mellow, so I sat Good. at Altus Cafe at the end of Trinity Street, which is by, so far the best coffee I found here. Um, and I was reading it, and I saw one of the responses to that article that we're talking about, uh, a letter to the editor that was basically saying, "Look, there's all these things." silly things, but there's like tens of thousands of them that we're not doing anymore. So it used to be on a road trip, you would get lost sometimes, and you would just drive around for a little while until you found where you were going again, and you would have to go by paper maps when you like changed what state you were in. And now you have GPS on your phone, and it was you know effectively free. Google Maps is free. Um, so you don't buy those paper maps, and you don't waste that gasoline, and you don't waste that like tread on your tires and stuff like that. And that's a silly example, but it's one of like thousands and thousands. I think we don't realize um, the, how much uh, our facility with information has changed. Because you remember going to the library to write a book report when you were a kid. Sure. Uh, yeah. And so now you, some of it is going to be trivial. right? Like some of our, our newfound power is going to be wasted on things like I'm watching the Academy Awards, and boy, that actor looks short and I go to Google and type how tall is whoever, and I instantly get the result, which is not something that would have been possible before, but probably isn't a huge productivity gain either. Mm -hmm. um, but there is huge productivity gains, I think, in, in the same way that like, calculators made, we'll see, um, made us better at math. Now, I'm like, because I have a calculator on my phone, I'm way better than Leibniz was at doing arithmetic like in terms of speed, I don't, I would not personally have invented calculus um, as a result don't of that. sell yourself short. <laughs> you may have. But yeah, maybe in, in another life. But um, that, you know, there's a, there's a power to that. So now we can take for granted the ability to do arithmetic, which would have been a marketable skill on its own, you know, 50 years ago. Um, it would have been like a, a big advantage that people had. So it's, I think it's, it's very difficult to tell. I do think that in the same way that we, we, we might ask someone, like, what would, what would someone have to pay you to take Slack away? Like, what would people have to pay you to take away the internet, you know, or Google? And no one would go back, I don't think. I mean, if so no one had the internet, then I wouldn't feel bad that I would, didn't. Oh, yeah, no, if, if no one did, yeah, then we can go back to this idyllic world. Yeah, um, everything might have been perfect. better. Yeah, oh, 70s were infinitely better. <laughs> um, but I think it's an important, I mean, it, it is really, we are, anyone over, I don't know, like 30 or so is in the last generation of human beings that have, will have experienced life before and after the internet. Because it's every generation after this is going to have it forever. Like 10,000 years from now, 
100 million years from now, some form of something like the internet is going to be in the, in, in the lives of the people of this species or like species that come after. Um, it just, like it's, it's important enough to us. Um, I've never interviewed someone who's talked about the next species. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, That's the next, thinking far ahead. Yes. That's a visionary. <laughs> I, I mean, I really, I do like to think about it in those terms because I do think that this, the internet itself, and so this is nothing to do with Slack, but this is like all of the history of computing technology, like Adam Lovelace and Charles Babbage and John von Neumann and Alan Turing, up to like microchips and computers on everyone's desks and now um, mobile phones and stuff like that. And then the internet on top of that is something that we're just like, we're still at the very, very beginning of its application um, in the same way that when electricity was first commercially available, the first application was electric fans because an electric motor was the easiest thing to make and the motors for a fan was small enough. And people were like, okay, well now we've made fans and now that's it for electricity. Like, now we've exhausted its potential uses. And it took many decades to, to kind of unpack that I think we're still at the very beginning of unpacking this, but when it's done, the perspective of an anthropologist, like 10,000 years from now, will look back at this time as as significant for us as a species as like, you know, the domestication of animals, the development of agriculture, the division of labor, but probably above those things and like just below the development of spoken language and the development of written language. Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> Why? Why do you think so? Um, well. So the reason now, I don't know. Well, I don't know what the description for this panel was, but this is definitely not going to be it. Um, uh, the the thing that was important about language for us as a species was the ability to accumulate knowledge and pass it on. So like the things that all that the parents learned in their lifetime, they could then communicate to their children, and the things that this group of people learned over here could be shared with this group of people and, and vice versa. So like it allowed um, a much faster change in our behavior than would have been possible if it was just regular biological evolution on our own. We had the evolution of ideas and the development of written language was like an enhancer on that because there was a higher fidelity and it could be spread to more people. Um, you think about the impact of the printing press it took several centuries to really to unpack and it, literacy went from something that was reserved for like, you know, 1% of the population or a half a percent of the population to most people in developed countries. Um, the kind of access that we have to information today, and it, and it includes things like how tall is Paul Rudd or something like that, um, but it also includes like, what are quarks and leptons and how many galaxies there are there in the universe and what are the fundamental forces in biology and economics and history and science and all these things um, is totally unlike what it would have been to you know, a medieval bricklayer working on some cathedral in Europe um, and obviously very different than it would have been for like a Bronze Age hunter-gatherer or something like that. And um, the, the internet is just like, like the supercharged, the turbocharged version of, of spoken language and literacy put together. So how, like, how, how long do you think we'll be able, like, how, how much will we have to wait to sort of see these, like, superhuman gains in, in collective intelligence? We're seeing them play out this election cycle. Yeah, it's obvious, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, I wish I could remember what that saying was about when someone becomes rich, because we have become rich in this technology. I bet They've Google could help. More of themselves. Yeah, I know, but I can't, I don't have my phone with me. Someone will Google it. Um, but we do become more of ourselves, um, and there's definitely all kinds of people in the world, all kinds of, you know, different things that people are scared of or different things that people are excited about. Um, but I think we're starting to see it already. You know, like, it, it, it doesn't, it's like the frog in the pot of water. Like it doesn't, it's hard to notice when it happens to you. It's hard to realize how much of a difference um, has happened in the course of our lifetimes. I think the, when I said before the, um, you know, like that, that bot that will tell us all mm -hmm. of the stuff that we would want to know inside of our organization, bringing it back to Slack and reality for a second, there's, people talk about the consumerization of the enterprise, and usually what they mean is the software is pretty, 
or it's simple to use, which has now kind of become table stakes because people are used to this much higher level of, um, of, sort of design, basically. But that wasn't the interesting part. The interesting part is when I go to Google, I can start typing something, and I'm a third of the way through typing it, and now it knows what I was going to ask. I hit enter, and like 800 milliseconds later, there's the result one boxed. And that's not the experience that people have inside the workplace. The experience inside the workplace is someone sent me something last week, and now I can't, I just blew 45 minutes trying to find it. Right. So you don't have that same facility with information inside the workplace, and that's something that I think will make a big difference to, to our productivity. But ultimately, you know, if we just end up working the same number of hours and are more economically productive as a result, that's one thing. What would be nice is if those productivity gains translated into like some of the economic gains being devoted towards people writing poetry or you know playing music or something like that. Okay, let's talk about startup funding. All right, <laughs> perfect. Um, I, I, you, you raised money like last May, and when I talked to you then, well, I talked to you before then, and you said you didn't need any money, and then you raised money. Uh, and you said you did it because like it was super easy to raise money. Yeah. Um. <laughs> okay, so we did this interview it was a, and it was a Q&A. I didn't realize, I thought it was just, you were just asking me questions and I was When you talk to a journalist, they generally write. Well, I, know you were gonna, I know you were gonna write a story, <laughs> but I didn't realize it was gonna be presented in Q&A uh, okay. format. So I don't know if you remember this, but the first question you asked me is, um, don't you have enough money? And then I responded, do you have enough money? Right. But the style guide for the Times is you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to italicize words, because it was way funnier when right. you, do you have enough money, was italicized, and it didn't, didn't, my joke didn't come off at all, I don't think. <laughs> Should have written to the public editor. Yeah, true, uh, ombudsman, and say sometimes italicization. Right. No, I agree, yeah. we should italicize. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, that was, um, in that same thing I said, the easiest time to raise money ever. Like maybe. Since the ancient Egyptians. Yeah, and I think that's probably about right. I mean, it, that was, and that's why we did it. Um, so that was a good business decision. And now it would be harder. So why has it become harder? Um, because the, there's been a change in the public markets. I mean, the. I'm going to turn 43 soon, so I was born in 1973, and I'm trying to think. Yeah, here's a graph of like the S&P 500 from when I was born, 1973. So this is stagflation, which everyone thought was impossible and couldn't ever happen because there was inflation at the same time. Um, uh, productivity uh, increases were slow, and like the growth in GDP was slow, and it goes like this. And then like 1979, Business Week had that cover, our equities over. You know, like they thought like now human beings will never invest in stocks again. They'll just invest in bonds. And then 1982, Paul Volcker um, causes the interest rates to rise to 18%, and every real estate developer in the world goes bankrupt. And then 1987 was the, that first like flash crash, um, Black Thursday. And then 1991, I graduated from high school, terrible recession. None of my friends could get jobs or anything like that. Slow build up over the 90s to like the dot com era, and then. Whoop, boom, you know, um, and then slow build up from like 2003, 2004, 2005, so I'm gonna get close to you. And 2008, boom, again, and then now we're like up here. So yeah. um, if you're following that pattern, there people are expecting the boom, again. Um, and it, I have painfully learned not to try to time the market before. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that like, people should do something now because the market's definitely going to do X in the future. Reversion to the mean is likely at some point, you know, and so there, and, and there has been a business cycle and when it was first proposed, it was controversial, but when it was first proposed, it was like 1810. So like since 1815, people have been, there is a cycle, it spins up, goes down, and there's a widespread perception that we're going down. So, for startup funding, I think it's actually a little bit more interesting story, though, because uh, there definitely will be uh, a shift in venture capitalist behavior dependent on what's going on in the public markets. But it takes a while, and all the VCs um, who invested you know, last year at very generous valuations were themselves taking money from their limited partners at very generous valuations, so to speak, so mm -hmm. much bigger funds. So they're taking money from like pension funds and university endowments and rich individuals and stuff like that. So if they, the way VC works is if you raised a, a billion dollar fund in 2014 or 2015, 
which would have been a $400 million fund before, the rules of VC don't change. In other words, the VCs don't want to take over a business. They're not like private equity investors. They want to own just, basically they want to own 25%. That's the, the, the best deal for them. And they didn't add a whole bunch of partners um, so they can do the same number of deals and they want the same percentage ownership. So the only variable left is for the amount that they're investing to go up. And if the amount they're investing goes up, either the valuation of the company goes up or they're investing at a later stage, right? They still have those billion dollar funds and they just, they're never gonna go and give the money back to the LPs. I mean, maybe that'll happen in some extreme case. Um, if they don't invest it, they don't get their management fees and also their career is over because you, you can't take a billion dollars from people and then say, I'm just gonna sit it out for five years or something like that. So they're gonna, I mean, they might pull back temporarily and I think we have seen that over the last couple of months. Um, but they're not going to pull back forever because they just can't. Like, Why do you care? You are... Well, because you asked me. But no, but, well, you know, I... I... <laughs> cool, yes. Uh, you told me before you are close to being profitable. Yeah. And so you, and you, already, and you have a whole bunch of money in the bank. I read recently that you were thinking about raising more money. You don't have to say... You can say either way. But, like... Um, Okay, would you raise money again? And if so, what are you doing with all that money? Well, so, <laughs> there's, there, so the motivation to raise money now mm -hmm. would not be a great motivation, but it is a motivation, which is um, we have to compete with Google and Facebook. And it's like the narrative changes so quickly, right? And I think that there is a lot of um, people who are very eager to write the story that all oh, of this is going to turn to shit. Like, it'll be a wasteland. Like, San Francisco will be as it was in 2001, 2002, and everyone will go back to Cleveland, and um, apartments will, that were 3,500 bucks a month are now gonna be 1,200 bucks a month, or whatever. Um, the reality is that over the last two years, uh, compensation has gone crazy, like in, in, and especially in the last six months, and we compete with other startups for, for hiring people. We also compete with Google and Facebook, and the the rate of increase over the last couple of years has been spectacular, but especially over the last six months. So when the narrative changes um, and we're hiring people, they say, hmm, you know, I keep on reading all these stories about unicorpses and things going bad. Um, why should I believe the value of your equity versus the value of Facebook or Google or something like that? Where, you know, they're public and it's kind of, you know, it's, it's very liquid. Um, so, like, that's the only, getting a valuation tick, it's called, would be the only, um, rationale for us to raise money because we still have all of the money that we raised last time and pretty much all the money that we raised the time before that. The other motivation, the reason to have cash, is if we can accelerate our growth. So as we get bigger, as the absolute numbers get bigger, the percentage rate of growth decreases, which is another way of saying that the rate at which we're accelerating is less quickly than it was before, but we're still accelerating mm -hmm. in terms of growth. If we can find efficient ways to grow more quickly, then we would want to spend money on that growth. Because having money in the bank doesn't do anything for us. We get 30 basis points of interest, and it's, it's more or less inert. Um, whereas if we could spend money to, to grow more quickly, then we definitely would. Um, one more question before we turn it over to the audience. What do you think of the Apple FBI case? It's a, it's a tough one. So we filed uh, amicus brief in support of Apple, and um, I, this one's a, a little bit of a strange case to me because I feel like given all the things that the NSA has done in the past, being able to um, crack the phone. So it's not that bad. It seems well within the bounds of the things that they're capable of. So it, there is a little bit of a perception, well, I have a perception that this was a cherry pick case because it would have public sympathy because who's gonna say I'm on the side of the San Bernardino shooters, right? You know? right. Um, I, Going back to what you said about uh, about Slack and and how I very deftly responded um, with the screenshots in the Twitter or the Tinder case and the Sony hack and Enron and stuff like that, the, we like everything that we do now is recorded in some way. Like every you know the Uber ride and every payment that you make and like you know everything is, is there somewhere. And anyone with enough money can get good enough lawyers that you are forced to then turn over all this information. And a bunch of junior paralegals will pick through every single aspect of your life to try to find the things that are relevant. And that's an uncomfortable feeling. It's not about you know having things to hide. It's just like you wouldn't want people going through your house all the time and like looking at all your stuff is just it's a, it's a little bit weird so the um 
the protection afforded to people's individual privacy by encryption, I think, is really important. I also don't like the idea of the government compelling um, Apple to do that kind of work. So, it's, on the same, you know, at the same time, none of these questions are easy or simple, um, and there's all kinds of like almost crafted for like moral philosophy 301 class setups of what do you do if it's a balance between like if it's the terrorists are going to kill your family and all you the only thing you can do is give up encryption for everyone. Yeah. Um, okay, we have questions. Okay. Can you Relatedly, can you talk about the role of custom emoji, custom Slack bot responses, and giving machines a sense of humor? Hashtag ask Stuart. Um, I can talk. I don't wonder what that was related to. I think you can just say, yes, I can. Yes. Oh, OK, sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't so know. One thing that, let me back up. There's a lot of things that we have done that I think were the right things to do and were super clever, but we didn't think of them in advance. We just like walked into like the, the perfect setup. So like messaging is an application that is very strategic now because of the proliferation of different software product categories that don't all hang together. Um, and we didn't think about that in advance. It just happened. Um, but another thing is that I think people historically have felt very boxed in at work. Like they don't get to bring their whole selves to work. They don't get, they don't feel like they're very well expressed in their personality. Um, and so those little bits of humor or little bits of playfulness, I think, are really important to us in the terms of the product design, in terms of the branding, and letting people come up with their own Slack bot responses, letting people come up with custom emojis as a means of expressing themselves more fully than just like the, the pure, simple work use cases is um, something that's made a big difference to how people perceive Slack and how people end up using it. So I don't know, you want to ask these questions? or Sure. Well, um... What are some slacking policies that Slack has implemented? So some of these are, are complicated. I'll give my favorite simple example. We have um, a great customer experience team, and they're very well trained. But nevertheless, every once in a while, they'll be stumped by something the customer says. So the customer says, hey, I did x, and then y happened. And they read that, and they think, hmm, I'm not really sure what was supposed to happen in that case. So in the early days, they would just, when we were eight people or 20 people, you could just post so everyone can see it. Hey, customer says they did X, and then Y happened. What do you think? Um, and someone would come up with the answer. Fast forward to now, you know, we have 400 employees now. But even when we got to like 50 or 100 people, them asking that question would cause 10 or 20 people to stop what they were doing and go, hmm, I don't know. I'm going to go look up in the original spec doc what was supposed to happen, or I'm going to open that bit of code and, and like parse through it to try and find like what you know what was expected. Um, and then one person will be the fastest to answer, and then the other 10 people just wasted their time. And as the number of people increases, that increases. So we came up with what we call triage channels, where there's representatives from different parts of the company who are on duty for a specified set of time to field questions like that so that not every single question has to be answered by every single person because again is there like a so there's a schedule yeah yeah and there's a lot of discipline that we've developed internally around those things because slack gives so much more power to communication and makes people much more effectively heard and so then you have to start to be selective about which things are being heard by which people what are the do you have rules that's say what people shouldn't do or can't do? Um, there's a lot of etiquette, I guess. I and mean, so like, that is one of them. Um, th there's a real tension, though, because there's, on the one hand, it's better for a question to be asked and then answered in public, because then everyone learns from it. Um, but if every single question is asked, you know, posed and visible to every single employee, then that's a lot of time that they're going to spend thinking about it. And some of them are, are like little simple questions, like when is someone back from vacation? 100 people don't need to spend their time thinking about it. And I think that's going back to the bot stuff. I think that'll be where bots actually deliver huge value in those kinds of questions. Um, where, what will Slack be in five years? So we launched just over two years ago, like two years and, and three weeks ago or something like that. So five years seems like an almost infinite distance into the future. Um, but the things that I mentioned before, I think the platform will be more and more developed because I'm, I'm definitely a believer in messaging and the, um, the power, especially of occasional use apps, like where you wouldn't install the whole app. Um, it, it's almost like the messaging is similar to a web browser and then it gives all this surface area to developers to do things that they wouldn't have otherwise had. And there's a lot of stores, like the place where I bought this shirt, I wouldn't install their app. 
You know, right. there's just like there's way more apps than you could ever possibly install. However, I like this shirt a lot, and I actually went back to the store and bought another one. But if I did, you know, if I was living in some perfect WeChat Chinese world where the, all the stores were already on the messaging application, I would have just messaged them and said, right. with a photo of the shirt, and say, I would like another one of these, but I can't tell from your catalog which one it is. So what will Slack be in five years? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there will be a lot more functionality available via the platform. So I think that'll be the, the big difference for. Will you, um, will you be an independent company? I hope so. Why do you hope so? Um, I mentioned earlier that I'm about to turn 43. I also mentioned timing and luck. Um, so we are clever and we work hard, but everything, like every time there was a coin toss, it came up in our favor, like just over and over and over again. Um, and I'm enjoying this, and I will never have an opportunity like this again in my lifetime, for sure. Right? Because of the scale of this, both the, the scale of like how well the business is doing now and how big we think the opportunity is. Um, if we were ever going to see how far we could take it, this would be the time to see how far we can take it. Do you feel that email can ever truly be killed, or will it always have a place in society? The 10,000 year view, who knows? Um, but no, I, I definitely don't think it can be killed. I mean, it's the, um, and this is, I mean, this is, sounds derogatory, but it's complementary. It is the lowest common denominator form of communication. So it means it crosses organizational boundaries better than anything else. You can just expect that everyone else has email. So for that reason, and I spend hours a day in email, right? Because Slack is for internal communication. Right. And I communicate with a lot of people externally as well. And you're not going to build a Slack that communicates, that somehow works externally. No, I, I mean, people get, People say, oh, I really like Slack. I wish I could use it for all my communications. The problem with that is if you can use it for all your communications, so can everyone else, and then it inherits all of the problems of everything else, which is like spamming and scamming and phishing and, and all this stuff. But one of the reasons that people like it, I think, is because there's a hard membrane around that whatever the organization is that's using it, um, whereas people get irritated at the sales pitches they get in email or the excess LinkedIn requests or whatever. So as you sort of like put all the good stuff in, in Slack, like more and more, like email will be worse and worse over time. I didn't think about that, but yeah, I guess that's probably true. Although it's also, it took for me personally, like maybe 15 years to really trust spam filters, um, but now they're pretty good. And I think like the next level of applied machine learning can be kind of like spam filtering, not for spam per se, but for email that I just don't want to read. Um, so one of the things you're spending money on is advertising, TV ads and other ads. Uh, so what led to the decision to use paid ads instead of purely word of mouth advertising? Um, it's a hope that paid advertising will be an effective means of driving growth because there's, there's a couple ways we'll grow, right? One is, and this is the best way and this is what, how we have grown so far and we will like to continue this forever, which is people really like it and so they tell other people about it and then other people start using it and that's, you know, by far the best because if someone you trust tells you that this thing is good, then you're much more likely to, to you know, be inclined to use it. Um, the second best would be paid marketing in the broadest sense, so advertising, but also like sponsoring events and, um, and, and holding events and things like that. And then the last one would be sales. And the good thing about advertising is it's very scalable. Um, you can just add more money and then you get more results. And when you want to stop, you can just stop. Um, if in a sales-driven organization, it's hard to, to rev up the speed because you have to hire more salespeople. And if you ever want to stop, then now you have to lay all those people off, which is a horrible situation to be in. Um, so we're spending money in advertising now to see how effective it is for us. And if it is effective, then we'll definitely spend a lot more. But we're still in kind of the, the early testing stages. OK. It says, I think please that's wrap it. up. It says, wrap up. I think that we wrapped up. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.